Thank you, Professor Arwin. Morning, everybody. Uh, I will begin with completing the title. First lesson we learn in group theory is that every group is a quotient of a free group. By that result, every group ring is a quotient of a free group ring. So I want to take you outside the finite group theory that we discussed mostly. That S dot that you see is a word for sing, which is a common middle name in some parts of India, in particular in Punjab. The three institutions that you see are all in the northern part of the country for the benefit of colleagues from outside. Punjab University Chandigarh is my alma mater for a master's and the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. These are new institutions which have come up in the country starting with 2006. And Ashoka University is another new institution. A private university about 40 kilometers from Delhi. These are all northern universities, institutions. Okay, I would like to dedicate this talk to the memory of two of my late friends, Sundarkanta Gupta and Narayan Gupta. Uh, both of them were at the University of Manitoba in Canada. Very strong group theorists, both of them. I visited them several times. They visited my, wherever I was in India or outside. Both were fellows of the Royal Society of Canada and became distinguished professors in their university. So I'm not sure most of them, most of you work in free group rings. This is one monograph of Narayan Gupta, which he wrote which is published in 1987 under the title Free Group Rings. What I'm presenting are two papers published this year with Roman Mikhailov, who was invited here, but perhaps for some reasons he could not come. The first one is uh, Narayan Gupta's three novel subgroup problem and group homology, published in the Journal of Algebra. Second one is Dimension Quotients, Box Subgroups, Limits of Functors, published Forum Mathematicum, both of them this year. So, suppose we have a free group. And you take its integral group ring. And then for every two-sided ideal in ZF, you get a normal subgroup of F, which will naturally be free, <coughs> being a subgroup of a free group, consisting of those elements of the free group for which if you subtract one, then you land in A, <coughs> that ideal. And the identification of such normal subgroups, three groups, is a recurring problem in the theory of group things. The story began with a work of Agnes. Then he took the free group into the ring of formal power series in that many variables as the number of generators in F. And embedded the free group in the group of units of formal power series in non-commuting variables, as many as the number of elements in the basis, and used that to prove that 
the free group is residually null potent, that the lower central series of F will intersect identically. And on the way, we find certain subgroups of F, which are called dimension subgroups, and then went on to identify. So I'll come to that as, as I go along. And this theme uh, is, these are some of the monographs where this theme is pursued. Uh, and any book that you see in group rings would have some taste of it, but as a topic, you will probably find in more detail in these uh, monographs. Mine in, published in 1979, and the one by Gupta, which I just mentioned a minute ago, and a more recent, comparatively more recent monograph with Roman called Lower Central Series, Lower Central and Dimension Series. Of just a little bit of notation, I will denote by H dash the derived subgroup of H and by square root of H, those elements of the group over group whose some power non-negative non power lands in H, called the isolator of H in D. And the notation for the lower central series is that I will begin with the first term as gamma 1, and inductively, like everybody, find the gamma n plus 1 as the subgroup generated by the commutators, one element coming from G, and the one element coming from one before. So this is uh, the lower central series of G, every group has. <coughs> and uh, Narayan called this result of Magnus as the fundamental theorem of free group rings, that if you take the powers of the augmentation ideal of the group ring, free group ring, and look for these elements, which minus one should belong to the nth power, and it is the same as the in a term in the lower central series of F. <coughs> this result is uh, credited to us. However, <coughs> a closer look at Magnus's uh, paper reveals that he had actually determined it when you have the coefficients not over integers, but over rational numbers. So you really should have gamma and f isolated. But around the same time, you have the works of Witt, which says that the look factors of the look, by which it follows that the factors of the lower central series of f are torsion free, and therefore, the claim is okay. However, it probably prevented Magnus and Solitar, Ars Solitar to not to mention it in their book on combinatorial group theory. <coughs> they did not claim that as the way I've stated. However, most of the time, the result is credited to Magnus. Now, the Notation for the augmentation ideal is delta R, and the ideal generated by delta R, R is a normal subgroup of F, <coughs> and the ideal generated by that I'll denote with bold R. <coughs> so this is the two-sided ideal of ZF generated by elements of the type small r minus one, with small r coming from from capital R, normal subgroup. So that's the notation for the old R. The two of the problems which uh, in the subject have been of interest and have been widely investigated are one is the dimension subgroup problem, which translated in uh, the language of free group rings would ask for the normal subgroup determined by power of the augmentation ideal of the 
regrouping plus this ideal fold R or any normal subgroup R of F. And if you want to state normally as you would without going to the free group ring, then it is asking for the normal subgroup of a group G for which G an element minus one lies in the nth power of the augmentation ideal of the group ring of G. So these are the dimension subgroups and their identification is a serious problem. It's, it's more serious because it initially uh, led to uh, proofs which could not stand the test of time and had to be withdrawn. But they're, pub they're published. Therefore, it's, it's a rather subtle, subtle problem from that point of view because it misled a number of. The other is the Fox subgroup problem which is asking for the identification of the power of the augmentation ideal multiplied by an augment, the augmentation ideal of the norm subgroup. And so as a warm up, you can see that if you take the normal subgroup determined by gold R, then it will just be the normal subgroup R because you just go under the map that takes you from F takes you from F to F mod R. And so anything which is sitting in one plus bold R would be in normal subgroup R. It's an easy exercise to calculate the subgroup determined by the square of the augmentation ideal. It turns out to be the derived subgroup of F, which in the free group ring would read like the next line. <coughs> and Without that, it will read that the second dimension subgroup of any group G is the derived subgroup. This incidentally is something that you come across as you begin your study of homological algebra. Then you calculate the first homology of a group, integral homology. It turns out to be G made abelian. Next one, you see that if you take F cube plus R, then the answer is third term of the lower central series times r. The subtlety here is that f cube will determine gamma cube, gamma three of f by Magnus. R would determine the bold r will determine normal subgroup r. But when you add the two ideals and go to a bigger ideal, then what is the guarantee that the normal subgroup determined would just be the product of the two? Uh, <clears throat> this was a result which Higman, Graham Higman had noticed and had communicated to David Rees. So when I was working on my thesis, mentioned, and so it finally finds publication in, in my thesis published in the Journal of Algebra in 1968. And in general, it would say that the third dimension subgroup is the same as the third term of the augmentation of the lower central series of G. <laughs> now, if you multiply F and R, then it's an old result that it will determine the derived subgroup of R. And now, if you take two normal subgroups, R and S, then what does that determine? And you see these, these authors. And right is the first one who noticed that the subgroup determined by R times S would be the commuted subgroup of the intersection of R and S. And that you can see either in N right or in the monograph of Gupta. Now, if you go to three normal subgroups, so you have a free group F and there are three normal subgroups R, S, and T, and you take the augmentation ideals of all three of them and take the ideal generated by the product in the, in the free group ring of F, then what does that determine? This is a problem posed by Narayan Gupta in his monograph. And so that's why I have called, we have, Roman and I have called it Narayan Gupta's three normal subgroup. What does it determine? 
Before we took it up, I'll, I'll summarize for you the progress done until then. Our objective is this, the etymology of groups and derived functors of non-additive functors can provide a useful tool for investigating normal subgroups determined by ideals and free group rings. <coughs> that is the punchline I want to, to bring to your notice, that these techniques of homology and derived functors of non-additive functors can give you something useful if you are interested in, group, in integral group rings and their properties. This is the theme we have been pursuing for some time now, two of us, and these are some of the papers which we have published. One is on generalized dimension subgroups and derived functors in the general of pure and applied algebra. One is the subgroup determined by a certain ideal and free group ring in the general of algebra. And then, <coughs> Roman gave a talk in the European Congress of Mathematics at Berlin. And this is the published version of that, the third one. Okay, so the first, so now there are three normal subgroups. So various, at various stages, experiments have been done with both choosing your R and S and T in ones that suit you <coughs> so that you can proceed. The first one, as you notice, is the one, the middle one is the full group ring, full free group itself, R, F, S. The middle one is the augmentation ideal of the integral group ring of F, and on the left and right are sitting the normal subgroups, the ideal uh, augmentation ideals of the two normal subgroups R and S. And you want to know which are the elements of F, which when you subtract one will land in this ideal. And the claim of Kanta Gupta was that this answer is without the square root. That's what she claimed in 1978. And that was reproduced by Gupta in 1987. However, investigations uh, of uh, Roman and I reveal that that's not the case. You need the square root, and that's pointed out in this paper of 2016. So it would mean that you really are, if you put the square root, then you're really computing it over the rational numbers. And therefore, if you want over the integers, then you have to pursue further the torsion involved. Okay, uh, the next one, if the two sides, normal subgroups are the same, then the answer is easy. It is just the third term of the lower central series. And then there was a, another paper of uh, Storr, published in 1984, that if the two, two side ones are the free group itself, then the answer is the square root of, the isolator of the derived subgroup of R and F, the, com the commutator of these two, and its isolator. And his methods were homological. Okay, so if the two left ones are F, then this is the answer. This was noticed by Enright, Erle, and is available in Gupta's monograph. And then from F, if you take an arbitrary normal subgroup R on the left side, so R, R, S, then this is the answer, which in a way generalizes the result on the first line. And this is due to Ram Karan, Deepak Kumar, and Karmani, published in 2000. So if you define this isolator for three normal subgroups, then these results are essentially pointing out that the answer for the normal subgroup determined by RST is this square root. <coughs> so that's why I put a question mark. So that's the question which arises. Is this always the case or not? So the contribution that we have is to the case when one of the left ones 
is contained in T. So you have three normal subgroups, R, S, and T, and R is contained in T. And by the usual NT automorphism present in the group ring, it is the same as, the problem would be the same as the right one being contained in the leftmost one. So if you can identify this, then you would have answered, coupled with the results that I've already quoted, that the answer would be that if one of the two, one of these three is contained in either of the other two, then that would give that problem would be completely done if you can solve this case. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the result that we have here. If R, S, and T are normal subgroups of a free group F, such that R is contained in T, and the integral homology groups of R mod R intersection S are all torsion up to for three, four, and five, then the answer is this. Is listed here. <laughs> so we're not able to tell in general, but with this restriction on the homology of uh, R mod R intersection S, we, we possibly can. Okay. Well, I will give you some idea of the kind of things that go into it, but will not be able to prove it, prove things for you. Uh, Suffice it to mention that the methods are homological, combinatorial, or mix of everything. Ultimately, you want to say that this is the normal subgroup determined by. Okay, so I'll give you a taste of the kind of things that, that get involved. If F is a free group and R is under normal subgroups with S contained in R, then if you take the augmentation ideal of F, and factor it by the ideal generated by the augmentation ideal of R. So you go to F mod R. That will be a module over F over S because S is contained in R. So if you multiply, action is multiplication on the right. <coughs> then it turns out to be this quotient of ideals in the group ring of, Z of F. How do you get it? So since some, every talk should have some idea of proof, I'll give, indicate the proof of this one, but not most of the results which I will state. Look at the, look at Z as a, as a trivial module over F over S, and take its objective resolution, the one given by Grunberg, called the Grunberg resolution, of Z as an F over S module. And then you calculate the homology of second homology with F over S as coefficients using this, then you immediately are able to prove the result I mentioned. And on the way, you see the last line of the slide. It's an interesting evaluation of the tensor product of two quotient of two ideals, A over B and C over D, which are ideals in ZF, turns out as this quotient. Okay, so I won't, somehow you get that. Okay, then crucial in the investigation of this is the result of Ram Karan and Vermani, <coughs> which helps us to identify the intersection of the product of the augmentation ideal of R, S, and T, and the augmentation ideal of R and R intersection S. So they figured out via combinatorial arguments that this intersection is really the sum of these two ideals. And so I won't go stop to give you an indication of the proof but that's a result which plays some good role. Then you have the relation module, a relation module of, uh, if you take a, if you express a, a group as a quotient of F, I write it as F over R, and R over R dash, the derived subgroup of R, then, so R made a billion, becomes a G module. You can, depending on your liking, you can view it as a right module or a left module. 
then you will have to conjugate appropriately. <coughs> and so when you do that, then you have uh, the, these things coming from the homology. There is a relation sequence also, which allows you to embed the relation module in this quotient f over rf, which is a free module. So the relation module can be embedded in a free module, free G module. And as a result of that, you can show that r over r dash is always a faithful module. Relations may not be faithful, but relation modules are always faithful. Okay, now the, another technique is that you write, look at the group G written as R over R intersection S and is isomorphic to R S over S. So you get two relation modules for R, one as a presentation R over R intersection S and one as a presentation R S over S. And using that, to this is one of the ingredients that shows up in the investigations. Then these functors are of interest. This tensor product, symmetric square, interior square, anti-symmetric square, and the divided square. Uh, the point of interest is that these are constructions which all of you do, but the point of interest is that if you view them as functors from the category of abelian groups to the category of abelian groups, then they are not additive functors. And therefore, their derived functors cannot be calculated the way that derived functors were initially calculated using Carta Eilenberg methods. Therefore, you need a new theory to derive non additive functors, and that involves. Uh, taking your resolutions more carefully rather than just the usual objective resolution. And it's the derived functor's independence from the resolution that you take depends on the fact that your functor that you are applying is additive. So if the functor is not additive, then that theory breaks down, and therefore you have to take more finer resolutions which are constructed via simplicial methods using face maps and degeneracy maps. And it also depends, since there are lots of them <coughs> at each stage, uh, therefore it will depend on where you put your module, in which space place you put. If you begin from the nth stage, so the derived functors therefore are not just singly indexed, but they're doubly indexed. <clears throat> anyway, so you have I've recalled for you the definitions of these functors and go on. <clears throat> Another ingredient is the more homology used using what are called causal sequences. So I will not stop here. So the ultimately, the thing boils down to proving that this quotient is a torsion group. That's the use of the homological algebra is usually called chasing maps. So there are lots of diagrams and so on. You chase them and ultimately show that this quotient is a torsion group. And that shows that claim in the theorem. There are some more results of that type. And here is a instance of a group which tells you that it's not always quotient this is non-zero, so not always given going to be given by that isolator. Okay. Store proved this result, as you see this theorem due to store which said that if you take an element of the free group, which minus one is an FRF, <coughs> then its square will land here, R square F plus FR square. It's an interesting result, but his methods were homological and 
difficult to follow. Uh, and, and the result is implicit and not specifically stated also. So we went on, when we were investigating this, we went on to give a combinatorial proof of, of this effect. So we have this in this paper, a combinatorial proof of this result of store, which was proved by him using homological methods. And also, as, as I said, it's implicit there and not explicit, but it would be fair to give him the credit for it. <coughs> so that's, that's the reasoning I'm giving, that you needed to give a combinatorial proof of this. And there are some other results of the same type that we have in this paper. And uh, the general problem in free group rings, of which the foregoing are special cases, ask for the identification of normal subgroups, where you take a product of ideals, R1, R2, Rn, for normal subgroups R1, R2, Rn, and that would be the most general case. And we are stuck at the stage of three normal subgroups. So here is some progress towards more than three. And the reason I'm rushing through it is that I want to introduce to you another paper that we wrote, which I, as I said, published in Math Forum Mathematicum, called the Dimension Quotients, Fox Subgroups, and Limits of Functors. Dimension Quotients and Fox Subgroups, we, I've already mentioned to you uh, what are Dimension quotients, the dimension subgroups modulo the corresponding term in the lower central series. And in, same, in the case of Fox subgroups, you want to identify what is, the, what is the normal subgroup generated by a power of the augmentation ideal of F times the augmentation ideal of a normal subgroup. But there are some things which are apparently there, and we want the, the quotient by so these are the Fox subgroups. Limits of functors, I'll spend a minute to explain to you the limit of a functor. So this is the same story related as I have already mentioned to you, that how the problem arose. This paper of ours is intended to show that the fourth quotient, that means the fourth dimension subgroup of any group G, modulo the fourth term of the lower central series of G, that quotient, which is the fourth dimension quotient, can be realized as the limit of a functor. So I'll take you straight to what is meant by limit of a functor. So these are various cases which have been known in this, this case. <coughs> OK. This is a concept I am not sure if most of you would use it in usual mathematics that, that you're doing, but it's a good thing to, to learn. Suppose you have a functor from one category C to another category D. And the limit of this functor is an object sitting in the, in the target category D. And that is an object with the following properties. That you have a map from that object into every image FC. Okay? For every, every object in the category C, you have the object F of C in D. So the limit is an object in the category D with the property that you have a map from that object to every FC. So you have a cone. So you have, this, you have the elements of images of the objects in C under F, so that they're all spread out in D. And you have an object in D from which you have maps to all these. So this is the this is a cone with center that object. Okay? And furthermore, that it should behave well with the maps between the images FC and FC dash. If C and C dash are two objects in C, and you have a map from C to C dash in the category C, then you will have a map from F of C to F of C dash in the category D. So these maps from the object in D should respect the, those maps. Okay? So put another way, 
you have cones in the category D. Cones themselves can form a category. And the limit object is a terminal object in that category. Okay, so that that's would be one way to say it. So if your category doesn't mean that this, this object always exists. But if it does, it will have to be unique. So that's the situation. Now the category that we are interested would be that you take a group G and take maps to G from free groups. So, so maps, so this is, you can call it a free presentation of G. So the cat, all the free presentations form a category and with the obvious uh, map. So if you have, if you associate with the help of your presentation of G as F over R, some abelian group, then under suitable circumstances, that will give you a functor from the category of presentations to abelian groups. And you are interested in the limits of such functors. So that's what kind of industry that we have been doing. And it turns out that, for example, if you write G as F over R, then the derived subgroup of F modulo the derived subgroup of R times gamma 3 of F is a abelian group coming from every presentation of G as F over R. So this gives you a functor from the category of free presentations to the category of abelian groups. And you want to identify its limit functor. That turns out to be the derived, first derived functor of the symmetric product viewed as a functor on the category of abelian groups. OK. So OK, so I'll, I think I don't have too much time. So I will just tell you the main results of this paper. Here is one. Yeah. Our main result on dimension quotients describes the co-kernel of this certain, certain monomorphism and tells you that the fourth quotient, d4 over gamma 4, is tied up in this sequence involving the limit functors of certain functors. <coughs> so without any involvement of group ring, you have this particular sub-quotient of your G coming up as sitting amidst this sequence involving limits of functors. It's a, in a way, it is tying up some things coming from group ring, something coming entirely from a different world. Okay, and we have similar thing for the third quotient of the Fox subgroup by the subgroup, which is obviously sitting inside F3, that also shows up as the limit of, as the derived func value of the derived functor of the second symmetric power, first derived functor of the second symmetric power, L1 of SP2 denotes the first derived functor of the symmetric, second symmetric power, which is a non additive functor on the category of abelian groups, its value on this abelian group. Okay, and then we give you the third box subgroup and completely so claim by the earlier authors was that it is the square root of GS3R. So here is the torsion which is there. So we determine it without the without the isolator. And so it's that that's not not an obvious thing that what is the torsion involved? Because the, the when you put the square root, then you're hiding which are the elements whose powers belong to the D3R. Uh, okay, I think I'll...